Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. Welcome back, Sixers, to another episode of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies. This is episode 109. Today is May 9th, 2022. I am Bill, and I am joined, as always, by my thorough co-hosts, Amy and Jordan. Welcome. Man, okay, I I, I, I thought it was going to be tertiary. <laughs> I like tertiary. That could have worked. That could have worked. I like thorough. Yeah. Before we get started, of course, we want to remind our listeners that the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is not a spoiler-free podcast. That means if there is something in the Cosmere you haven't read and you're worried about hearing spoilers, you might want to head over to read those first, then come back and join the discussion. It's going to be a little different tonight because we are back on our discussions of Sanderson's Laws of Magic. Tonight, we are discussing Sanderson's third law, which we will explain in a moment. First, though, for those of you who listen to the podcast recordings or watch the videos on YouTube, we do want to remind you that it's possible for listeners to interact with us live via chat as we record our episodes at www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table. We record episodes of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies every other Monday night. Night. Nart. Nart. <laughs> Nart. 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 Narting, I mean, starting at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. So please join us. Take an active part of the discussion. Of course, the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is made possible by the support of our listeners and patrons. The show will, of course, continue to be free, but if you want to help us out, head on over to patreon.com slash Cosmere Studies. A buck or two per episode really, really helps us out, so please, just anything you can. But if you can't, we understand too. Patrons do get immediate access to our Discord channel, where you can talk about the show and the Cosmere with other listeners. We've got a great community. We've got some amazing discussions. We've got some amazing people in there. Like, seriously, y'all are awesome, and I enjoy seeing your discussions every time I log in. Um, You also will get early access to bonus episodes, exclusive access to other bonus content, and other good stuff. Jordan, how is the read-along going for the... It has not gone well. Oh, dear. (laughs) Oh dear. Uh, so, so for the re- Bill knows everything that's been going on over in my world. Um, things have gotten a bit chaotic over here. Basically, as soon as I started it, uh, a mountain of chaos. Some of it really good though, uh, fell upon me. But some of it, uh, other issues. <laughs> um, but point is, we're going to be trying these next two weeks to do a big catch up on it. Um, it's go- like the first one went great. Loved it. It was wonderful. Um, but yeah, just real life hit as soon as you make plans, that's when real life pounces, but we're going to push through. We've got this. That's when the universe looks down at you and giggles as soon as you make plans. Yeah. Well, so the biggest thing that's, and Bill knows this, I, uh, due to some issues, uh, with Twitch, I have moved everything over to YouTube. Uh, we'll talk more about this in the self-promotion part of it, but uh, any help you guys can give me over there so I can actually get monetization. That'd be awesome. That would be great. Ah, uh, okay. Well, but are, are we planning to come back to that or is this just sort of a dead in the water thing? Oh, it's not dead in the water. Okay. Uh, good, it's, good. It, it's, it, it'll get done. I just, I have to decide whether or not I want to shotgun my way through and just do one giant episode that covers a lot. Or if I just want to do a bunch of quicker episodes, but okay. Either way, we'll we'll get it done. Stay tuned to this channel. Yeah. Specifically, the Discord's the best way. If you're a, if you're a patron, you you'll you'll get the heads up. If not, just stay well, pay attention to the YouTube channel and, and to the uh, I'll and, have instructions there and to the socials. You can you oh can yeah, that's, yeah, those things those. exist as well. Yes, yes, they do. Cool. All right. Well, Sanderson's third law of magic. If you are new to Sanderson's laws, uh, we've done episodes on the first two previously so you can you're welcome to go back and search for those in our back catalog um the third law of magic though is expand on what you already have before you add something new jordan and i have referred to this as go deep before you go wide where you're basically you're basically taking one 
aspect and just really, really, really fleshing it out. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, one of the main ones is a lot of people are familiar with the whole iceberg metaphor where with a, with an iceberg, you only see the tip of the iceberg, but there's a whole lot more deep. Well, one of the other things that Brandon has talked about in writing excuses and in, in other scenarios is if you go really, really deep on one topic, then readers, a lot of times just their, their brain fills in the rest and says, okay, if he went really deep here, there's got to be a lot more deep stuff in all these other areas. I just don't know it yet. And they start filling in the gaps themselves. It's, re it's really a fascinating psychological study when you look at it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's also, I also think it's regular psychology. I just mm -hmm. think to normal conversation. And if you're having this, uh, you know, this in-depth conversation with someone and then someone derails it, you mm -hmm. know, just like, oh, let's talk about this other thing. Like, we were getting some meaty stuff over there. I think it's sort of is real. I think, I, I think it's just sort of a natural human thing. We tend to like to go mm -hmm. deeper with things. W wide's good too. Like we love, you know, big expansive worlds, mm -hmm. but if there's no depth behind it, if it's all skin deep, it doesn't feel very fun. Well, yeah, particularly like, I, I've actually had ahead. some discussions with Josh about other unrelated things but about how people will, will be like armchair enthusiasts and say like, oh, well, this would, if we did this, it would fix all the problems. And then if you stop and think about it for more than a minute or two, you go, wait, but it caused this and this and this and this and this and this, and this problem. Mm -hmm. And when you do more world building, just even your head or watch other authors do a lot of deep world building, you can interconnect things more quickly and build off of just like basics and then expand them quite a bit more, just mm -hmm. like the third law here. Yeah. One of the things that I've noted also is this is particularly important um, as, as an author or creative in, in multiple aspects, because when you go deep, it allows your readers to go deep because, and there are some people who will never go that deep, but for, I mean, this whole podcast exists because we like to go deep We we want to, you know, reach in and find the deeper aspects of the Cosmere and Brandon has, has created a playground for us to do that in. Well, it's something because it, it, one of the writing excuses podcasts, they discuss this very thing, mm -hmm. um, which you, you'd think, you know, Sanderson's own podcast would go into his own laws a little <laughs> bit. Um, but one of the things he says is that Brandon, he, he made these rules for himself because but he feels they work beyond him as well yeah. but they're, they're they're to help him with the world building so that uh the example he gave was instead you know if i'm like oh i need to i want to explore this concept i should make a culture that deals with it and it's like do i need to make a whole new culture it's like or can i examine the culture i already have mm -hmm. and there's going to be a splinter you know group off that one culture which then adds more depth to that culture. And I haven't had to create an entire side group over here. Cause I mean, people are not monoliths, like in especially groups of people are not all going to do the exact same thing. They're going to have, I mean, just, just look traits. at religion and how many mm -hmm. branches oh, yeah. there are off of just, you know, any religion you'll find seven sects of it. Yeah. Yeah. Brandon has, uh, you know, he, he divided this essay. And if you're interested in the essay, our show notes, we have a link to the essay that he wrote about this. It's in his blog. It was back in 2013, I think, is when it was actually written. It but should be on BrandonSanderson.com, too, I think. Or... What's, what's that? It is. Yeah, it, that's, yeah that, his, his blog is on BrandonSanderson.com. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, he, he divides it into three categories for, or for going deep. He has extrapolate, interconnect, and streamline. And what you're talking about was a big part of the whole streamline concept. Um, where like why you can either create a new religion or you can create a schism within a single re religion, which he did in Elantris. You know, you have the Shudareth and Shu Koreg, I think is what it's called. I think Shu, Shu Koreg and Shudareth, I believe are the two. Um, or, or I'm blanking now. Koreg might be the original that schism. Anyway, you have these it's two been a while. branches. <laughs> uh, it, it's been a while since I read Elantris. I need to go back. Shudareth. And, and Shudereth. That's what I said. Shudereth. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> no, and, I don't know um, the other one. <laughs> we need some titles for all the spellings. But anyway, um, 
he he went into this you know he had this singular religion that branched off into two and it really gave it some extra depth because the differences were enhanced by the similarities and the and the shared roots and and it just sort of gave it a more rich flavor i felt because because well, that there are things like that in our world that and so there's a familiarity Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Jordan. Oh, but. no, it's well, it, and that's that I was actually gonna make that same point. And just the whole it's a fantasy world. So obviously it's like, yeah, well, people can't draw, you know, little lines in the air and make things explode. Uh, and it's like, no. So then how can we ever talk about someone behaving realistically? And it's like, well, because we can sit here and be like, all right, well, how do humans behave? Mm-hmm. If this were a thing, they would still behave like you know people would Mm -hmm. and you know you show up to some utopia planet with everyone seeing kumbaya and it doesn't work but we can even see brandon explore that in uh era two of uh of mistborn where he gave them this uh this paradisical place Mm -hmm. and it's leading to all sorts of problems yeah yep because no, people um, will cause drama and conflict and yeah. do that. Sorry, I had something I was going to say and I've lost it. it you know, just Well, so gone. I think a good way to sort of examine, I think Vin is a really good uh, show of this from a power standpoint. Because mm-hmm. um, if you go to her big battles that she has in the book, we tend to actually see her not use the new powers she learns over the course of a book but rather we see her use skills she already has creatively. Yes. Um, so we explored the depth of ATM in the first book with her battle for Shan, mm-hmm. um, where she explores the fact that you can, you can be creative with your use of it to give the appearance of something. And even though this person has more power, you can still be clever with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, in her battle versus Zane, we see her extrapolating on you know the entire concept of what adium is and she's like all right i can use his version of seeing the future to give me a you know a, an idea of what i will do mm. and so i can become unpredictable for a moment mm-hmm. yeah well that's and, all you need but she doesn't solve it with you you would think it'd be with a dur, you know duralumin which is the big metal that they discover in that book but it's not well and the thing that's interesting about duralumin is that Duralumin is a new metal that's introduced, but it's really used to more deeply explore the other metals because mm-hmm. it's an it's an enhancer, mm-hmm. and so she, she uses it to burst the other metals that she has, which again is diving back into something that has already been put in place. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the whole reason they even know to look for it is because the and, but this and this shows why you 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 don't stop expanding outward. Showing al- alumin, uh, sorry, no, I was going to say it British way, aluminium. Dang it! Um, the uh, I, I I combined like the two wrong versions of the word. Um, <laughs> the uh, the uh, pretty that. much, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we see they. Uh, it was the inquisitors give it to her, mm-hmm. and suddenly she's like, "That's another metal." Holy crap! You know, and that expands the world outward. It's another metal that's not the eleventh metal. Yeah, and it's it's one of these things. She doesn't. She's make. She's she's real. She's always known. I don't know as much, and things don't quite fit. And so, giving aluminum there suddenly expands it out, but it doesn't expand it out in a way that actually gives the answer. Mm -hmm. And so, it's good because it actually both drills deeper and wider at the same time. So that in book two. She's like, all metals are paired. We, What's the opposite of this thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then they explore, you know, they go deeper on that. And it's and then by book three, they have Electrum. Does she end up, uh, she doesn't end up, get, you know, be, beating any battles with, with Electrum, her, you know, her new metal. It's, mm-hmm. again, like we see her doing the three horseshoe trick. Yeah. And we, you know, to, to solve one problem, we see her, you know, burning the mist, which is something else from the previous time. And you just start going through it. And, and it, that also ties into the first law, the one, which is, uh, um, 
the amount I'm trying to how think much you that, explain the magic is how much you can use it. Yes. I'm trying to, yeah, it's directly proportional to how big of a problem you can solve with it. Basically yes. how satisfactorily you can solve. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, th the same thing sort of ties in because Electrum, we don't know a whole lot about it and she doesn't solve huge problems with it. She solves the small problems with it. Hmm. And so, and, and so we, ha we haven't gone in deep. And so it's not a deep solution. Yeah. I like how these interconnect as well. <laughs> I don't think they were fully intentionally, but they make sense all together. And so they, there is sort of that interconnection. Yeah. Something that's interesting about this one as well is the fact that this one isn't, the other two are a little more explicitly about magic. Mm -hmm. um, this one applies to a lot more than just magic. Right. Yeah. It's just um, world building in general. Yeah. Um, one of the best examples of breadth versus depth, I think, is it the Marvel Cinematic Universe versus the DC Animated Universe. DC Animated um, Universe. Or sorry, not, or Cinematic Universe. Oh my okay. goodness, no. no <laughs> cinematic, or animated, so much depth. Uh, <laughs> the, the two cinematic universes, because Marvel started out as just these little... Uh, movies just person mm -hmm. to person and really drilling down deep on what what motivates this person. Yeah, well, that's very much the one character they're kind of focused on. Well, and, and I've said for years, one of the things that the Marvel Cinematic uh, Universe worked uh, so well was that be was because the movies weren't about Captain America or Iron Man or the Incredible Hulk. They were about... Steve Rogers and Tony Stark and and Bruce, uh, and Bruce Banner. You know, they 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 were about the individuals, and the powers were kind of secondary. Mm -hmm. Because you dove with, deep with, into with Tony Stark, it. like his whole thing becoming Iron Man is how he like fixes a big problem that he has, and then he, because of different character development he has, he continues to be Iron Man. And but you know, you'll you'll notice they don't stuff. they don't bring in the other characters until Iron Man two. And yeah, because they want the, that first one established. Well, because we got to establish who he is. And also, if we just jump into, oh, look at all these other characters that we have, mm -hmm. it would feel very unsatisfying because we're not exploring who is Tony Stark. Right. And yeah. what what is his struggle? Why does what because someone becoming a hero is an inherently insane thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so you got to find out what motivates a person. And it's it, you then compare it to, you know, like by the time Avengers comes out, we want to see these characters that we now understand. What's the next level of depth for them is mm -hmm. to now see how they play with each other. Yes. Yeah. Um, with their competing motivations. And the first Avengers movie handled that brilliantly. It was so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and so cause, but because basically everyone on on that set, with the exception of Black Widow, had at that point gotten their own film, but we'd mm -hmm. already met Black Widow through Iron Man 2. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it wasn't like just they just threw this r random new character at us. It was, and you know, she's it's like, and like she's just supposed to kind of be a mysterious character to an effect to, to a degree yeah. mm -hmm. as well. I mean, you know something about her, but she keeps a lot about herself hidden. So, well, yeah. And it's it's also to point out a, a minor failing in that movie. It's also the reason that Hawkeye doesn't land as well for some people. Because he was just sort of him. thrown in, and he was also thrown in. What are you talking like, about? We got one scene with him and Thor. We got one scene with him, very brief. Yeah. But and he was thrown in, and then he was also taken out of the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some fun memes about how the fact that like if Hawkeye's on your team, then you're gonna win. Because like when he was with Loki, he, Loki won, and then when he was with the Avengers, Lo Avengers won. So like it was back and <laughs> forth. But if he's on your team, you win. But. Uh, like, good old Clint's the good luck charm. <laughs> I know. It's fine. Um, no, but did you, you guys end up watching, continuing in the MCU, um, did you guys watch Eternals at all? No. No. But, so uh, so the big issue that I had with that is that you have like, I'm going to get that wrong, you have ten. like 10 people. There's 10. 10 of them. And you get them in such quick succession that you you can't get attached to them super well. Like there's a couple mm -hmm. of them that you're like, okay, I know what's up with this person and this person. And, but the other ones are all kind of fuzzy. I know they can, that's their superpower, but otherwise I don't know what's up with them. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a lot harder to introduce 10 characters no. as well as the 
antagonist and everything else in one oh. movie versus the other earlier MC movies where you have one character that's being focused on or maybe two. Well, and and this is where I do think this this uh, phase four of Marvel is starting to struggle is we need to reestablish why we should care about these characters. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to do when you've already had the stakes going up and up and up, and, you know, the way it's been going, mm-hmm. um, which is why I think in something like uh, the the new Spider-Man film, um, what the scenes everyone loves mm-hmm. are between the three Spider-Men oh, yeah. and all they're doing is they're just shooting the breeze. Like they're yeah. like they're those are our favorite other, scenes. Yeah. Again, it's, it's not Spider-Man. It's Peter Parker. Yeah. And it's the three different iterations of Peter Parker that we've seen before. Well, like, I mean, there, there are some other really good scenes, but they're usually payoffs for earlier arcs that those characters mm-hmm. have had. Yeah. But everyone's favorite scene is them just standing there on the Statue of Liberty being like, so who are some of the bad guys you fought? Okay, <laughs> so like I fought like a goo man and just like, and they're just they're just shooting the breeze about it because that's exa- like that's going in deep. It's I don't care. Like, it, the, Look, I know there's a bunch of villains, but I much rather just hear the Spider-Man just sit around and just wonder to themselves, you know, just it just start musing about man, this is a really weird business we're in, right? And it's like, yeah, you know. And or, it's or one even, the thing that or, I don't like about the Hawkeye series is the fact that we jump into this whole thing and it's all centered around Ronan, and it, it, like in his backstory. And I'm like, I mean, everything you guys are saying, I would much rather hear about, I want to see the series about his years as Ronan. That sounds incredibly <laughs> interesting. Well, like to build on to that before you start, you know, trying to build out other characters off this whole legacy. I think that would be really good. Well, but and then uh, they have the same problem they had with the Black Widow movie in that they they'd already kind of moved on past a lot of those storylines and those things. And then they're suddenly. I, so, I, I mean, this is maybe getting too much into, you know, media critique Weeds. territory. I, I, I personally think the Black Widow movie would have worked better as a series. It hmm. could have, but I think it just should have happened sooner than it did. Yeah, is the other big factor. Well, yeah, definitely. And I still but, liked it, but it just the, it went better earlier. The the other thing, going back to Spider Man, that was actually one of the things that Brandon brought up in the essay is one of the failing examples of this is Spider Man Three, which is the one which is one of the most panned superhero movies of the twenty first century. Um, Executive the, meddling the movie. Because they had so many villains, and again, none of them was ever really able to be fully developed. It was just so scattered, and it couldn't figure out what it was because it was just trying to to go so wide. Yeah, and and there were, I think there was supposed to be a fourth movie too, so it didn't feel as resolved at the end because they had left themselves a little bit of room to do more later, but then that never happened. Well, and I think the same thing happened with Spider Man, the er, incredible or amazing Spider Man too. Yes, it yeah, did. The, there, were, there were lots of issues with mm-hmm. that too. But that's that, and that's another of the positives of um, Spider Man No Way Home is they were going deep. They were going deep into previously established series that weren't even con- interconnected, but they were taking everything in that movie mm-hmm. was something that had been pre established. Yeah, there were so even many with the, everything that they went wide on was still going deep. It, it, it was really a fascinating. Mm-hmm. Well, and and to bring it back to the okay. original point about it compared to the the DC cinematic mm-hmm. universe was we got a Superman film, then we got Batman versus Superman, and it's mm-hmm. like wait, we don't really even know this Batman, but mm-hmm. okay, I guess we'll go into this and, and then, Wonder Woman. Yeah, yeah. Wonder Woman's just gonna show up, it basically like, and then she gets her movie later. Yeah, right. and, and notice when we get her film, it's, good. it's fine. When we get just the Aquaman film, everything's just fine. But then, but even before that, we get the Justice League film, and it feel and obviously there's all sorts of other complications that film had. Right. Um. But one of the biggest ones is it's like okay. You've now thrown Cyborg and Flash at me and Aquaman at me, and we haven't had a film with these characters yet. Why should I care what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still haven't seen that. That's okay. 
It really is. Um, <laughs> no, it's just it's one of these things where you gotta you, you gotta earn stuff like that, and so yeah. go, going going deep, it matters because it's gotta feel it's gotta feel like it it works for us. It's really hard to pull off an ensemble cast mm-hmm. out of nowhere. Yeah, like and there, there, the there's shows that there's shows that pull it off. Like Firefly comes to mind. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Where but they, but they tend to really focus on individual characters per episode. And the relationships between those characters. Like in the first in the first episode, you introduce your whole cast, but then you go in deeper to those pre existing relationships. You go in to, and look at Rivers and Simon's relationship. You go in and look at the captain's relationship with uh with Zoe. Zoe and Wash and you, you find out about how, you know, about how Jane came on. You, you, Cause yeah, that's you, a lot you, of it is going back in and finding yeah. out who those characters are. Yeah. And so, but and seeing their growth and the progress, but it takes, if you're going to approach it that way, you really gotta, you gotta do it carefully. And we're willing to give them a little more leeway in a television show than a movie, because over the course of a television show, you're going to get a lot more time to develop these things. But a movie, yeah. you know, we're only there for a maximum of like two and a half hours, maybe. maybe but even, three. well, and <laughs> another example of a television show where it, this, it actually was good at the beginning and then it just sort of started to lose its way was lost. I remember when that huh, series ironic. first, when, when that series <laughs> first came out, um, because what it did is each episode, you took one of the characters from this ensemble that is introduced at the very beginning and you dive deep, you get flashbacks into who they are and where they came from. And that continues over the course of the series until some of the later seasons. But what's, but as the uh, series continued, they kept trying to go broad and and not diving in. They kept asking questions that they weren't answering. And over the series, over the course of those six seasons, people started falling off after series after series one, people started falling off over, over series two and three and then season four hit and people just started, it started hemorrhaging and to, to, because they just wouldn't answer any of their questions. They kept, frustrated. they kept, introducing more questions and answering maybe one or two to the point at the end. Why did it all end at a church? <laughs> See, I, I don't know that I made it into season two of lost. Mm-hmm. I gave up on it, but, but yeah, pay payoffs are important and character yeah. payoffs are, I think are the most important ones. Mm. Um, but even plot ones, Brandon's good at this because, because Brandon does the same thing where he'll, answer one question but mm-hmm. open up a pandora's box along mm-hmm. with it the the best one i think being the end of uh of uh bands of mourning where mm-hmm. suddenly we get the the coin and you know we get survive and it's just like what what what, what? <laughs> and you're just like don't worry secret history's here all right secret history that's going to definitely explain why Kelsier is alive. And then you get into secret history and it explains a lot and it answers a lot of questions that we weren't even thinking of asking. And it goes deep. It goes, oh, it goes so deep. But oh, yeah. but the end of it, you're like, I still don't know how Kelsier is alive. So you answer all these, but there's still all these other ones that are still very open questions. It's funny because you understand how Kelsier is not dead, but you don't understand how Kelsier is alive. Yes, you don't get. You don't know how he got from this point to where he is in in, in that one, and you're like, wait, there's a big gap. Mm-hmm. What happened? But well, Brandon's good about that because he he gives us satisfying answers in mm-hmm. Secret History, so that when you end with uh, I don't, I still don't know my the answer to my original question. You're sort of okay with that because yeah. you feel like you've progressed towards something. And for the record, if you ever just if you haven't done so and gone back and reread the Mistborn trilogy after reading Secret History, you're really doing yourself a disservice. <laughs> the The trilogy is so much cooler uh, once you know Secret History, because there's little <laughs> things in there. You're just like you just sit there. You're like, Brandon, oh, you are that so was good. Kelsier. Yeah. <laughs> But, but it's, I mean, in another sense with Stormlight Archive, like you're sitting here going, okay, so how did Vasher and, and Vivenna get mm-hmm. there? And what changed? Because they were tight before and now now they're not so much, let alone there's Nightblood 2.0, kind of. 
we don't she, know exactly that sword's name. The, the, she's not just looking for him. It feels like she's hunting him. I know. Like, it's a very different thing where she's like, no, I'm going to follow you around. And, and I don't know if there's like a crush involved or, or if she just admires him or what. But that is not how she feels in Stormlight Archive. So, no. yeah, very, very different. Well, and it's still not even clear where exactly in the timeline Warbreaker takes place. We know it happens before Stormlight. We don't yeah. know how long before Stormlight. Mm-hmm. And we're waiting for it to find out what happened between Warbreaker and Stormlight because, yeah, yeah, lots of lots of new developments. Things have changed. Yep. No, and so, but that's but once you've gone deep, you're allowed to do that. Also, think of like uh, something something like uh, Rhythm of War. We go really deep with Kaladin mm-hmm. in two different aspects. One is the mental aspect with him mm-hmm. because he's he's at the start of the book already really exploring what it is that he needs to be doing who you know who am i supposed to be but then when the attack happens and he's you know having to, to go die hard on everything um he really starts exploring what can i do if i can't fly mm-hmm. yeah and the, we see start see the magic of uh it's gravitation Yes. No, gravitation is the flying, isn't it? Yes, yeah, sure. Cohesion. Cohesion. Yeah, adhesion. That's Ad- adhesion. Yes, adhesion. Um, and we really start, he starts really exploring a part of his magic that he had sort of been not completely kind of neglecting, but not not really studying it the way he should. Yeah. And so it allows for him to, to re- really start to get some fine control. Um, I also think of Vasher's training of Renarin, um, when he was training him to use the shard plate. And like one of the first lessons is, all right, we're having a tea party. You could learn and, how to do this with armor on. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, just trying to get that, that fine control of mm-hmm. something that's inherently this big unwieldy thing. Yeah. And that's going really deep on trying to understand what it is we're doing and by Brandon putting that in the book and showing us just a little bit of the training, he doesn't need to keep showing us all mm-hmm. of Renarin's training for us to believe by the end of this book that he would be competent at it. Because yeah. he went a little deep on this, and like Bill said at the start, our mind fills in the rest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if if uh, I'm trying to think of if there's any good costume equivalents, but the, I'm sure if you get a really good costume and you look at it, super super close and you look and you realize that they're not filling in every single detail but they're doing just enough to give you the effect that you're mm-hmm. looking for and you can go oh well obviously it's really made out of this or what or it looks like it's made out of this but it's they've just put in just enough shadow or just enough highlight or whatever else to make it give that look to give not, just not a depth. not a costume but similar uh, to what you're saying yeah. amy i remember in portal 2 um, I played it with the developer's commentary on, which is something cool that Valve does. Mm-hmm. Um, and they show where, like, if you look at Wheatley, if you ever play Portal 2, he's this little ball that blinks. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they show where, like, all, the way he moves, like, his eyelids, the eyelid, you know, quote unquote, yeah. but mm-hmm. it can't really exist the way it works. Like, there wouldn't be space for it. But mm-hmm. they hide it well enough that you're you're okay with it. You, it you're it not. Makes sense to you, yeah. The same thing with uh, Michael Bay talks about this in the uh, Transformers films. Which say what you will about the Transformers <laughs> films, you, no one can argue about the special effects. They are yeah. to die for. And when you see these transformations, there's all sorts of parts that you're just like, no, 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 no. Just it wouldn't make any sense. But it goes so quick. But then they show just enough detail. Uh, in the space of what's going on that your mind doesn't sit here and nitpick, uh, you know, where did that sprocket go? Where, where's the car? Well, it's actually kind of funny. Cause I think I know for some of them, at least because my husband's a big transformer fan, um, that they actually did figure out how they really would fit all the parts. Yeah. For some of them. I don't know if they did it for all of them, but I know for some of them, at least at one point during, the they can, Michael they movies. can figure out where to put all the parts moving yeah. them all would be a bit of a ordeal. That'd be scary. Yeah. But think of like the first time we see Optimus Prime transform. It is super zoomed in and it's a slow transformation that shows a lot of stuff moving. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Show that to us one time. 
And you, we you just can, know it happens. Yeah. You can you can do a lot of animation smearing in the action scenes, and we're yeah. just going to take your word for it that yes, this would work because you've shown your work at the start. Yeah. If mm-hmm. you if you show your work at the start, it's just it's just like school. If you show your work at the start, the teacher will trust that you know the answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's also like uh, I mean, ba- going back to the Avengers, you know that one shot that everybody always talks about, the oneer where you start with one of them and you follow across in a single shot. One of the things that that shot does is it gives you a feeling for the scope of the battle. Mm -hmm. And because that shot is in there, suddenly everything else feels bigger. It's really fascinating the way that just paying attention in the right area can make everything else fill itself in. Yeah. I'm now thinking to the Arkham series of games and how they do a good job of in the first game, you're stuck on the Island. Mm -hmm. And so you don't question why, you know, you can't go everywhere on the map because you're stuck on the Island and then city, Mm -hmm. they have these walls and there's guns and turrets. And so you can't get out of there. And Mm -hmm. so it's one of these things where, you don't question it. However, one foot high invisible walls really can rip you out of the game because it's telling Mm -hmm. you you're in a game right now. You're not in a world. Right. Um, But so even if you can just hang a slight lampshade on why you're stuck there, it goes a long way in making the world feel more real. And you see this in just small things with the level design. Like whenever you're looking way out into the city and it looks like there's a full city there, but if people start doing hacks to get beyond the walls and start flying towards it, you start to see, you know, it's 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 literally like a a, a set on like a theater stage mm-hmm. where it's like it's only the fronts of these buildings have any sort of depth to them. And if you go to the other side, there's nothing there. Because well, like they're, they're showing just enough to give the impression. Another example in video games would be Breath of the Wild, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Because this is an enormous game and there are lots of points of interest and there's a lot of space between those points of interest. But because those points of interest are so developed and just like just so minutely crafted, the the space in between, you you kind of gloss over it. You know, you see a forest and you fly over it, but because but that's not what's interesting. That shrine over there is what's interesting. You're trying, you know, and so field or whatever. Exactly. And so you kind of, again, you kind of fill in what hasn't been placed because that's not what you care about. Yeah. Even our podcast. (laughs) What? We, we, we went deep with these things before we went wide. Yeah. We started off going with the, the books individually before tackling bigger subjects because we established and and that's one of the reasons this works is when you go deep, you're establishing a framework and suddenly every, you have a point of reference that your, that your readers can get into or your listeners. Um, You know, we assume that people who come to listen to our podcast are familiar with the Cosmere, but we still laid out a basis so that we could build something around that. Yeah. I just uh, realized that we are Sanderson three laws compliant. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Pulling an Asimov. Nicely done. Oh, nice. Got my Asimov in my Sanderson. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. But yeah, that extrapolate interconnect streamline, um, interconnect, interconnecting things that already exist. Um, One of the things that really, and and extrapolating on it, one of the things that really stood out an example to me was in Avatar The Last Airbender, the original series. When they got to Omashu, it just sort of rocked my my world because you see them using earthbending for mundane purposes. You you, You explore, okay, if this magic exists in this world, how would that affect things like trade? and daily life 
where in Omashu, the er big slides. Yeah, in Omashu, <laughs> the earthbenders are sending these stone um, bins up to the top of the city and then letting gravity do the work when they're trying to transport in the opposite direction. It's a yeah. fascinating world building concept because it, and it's so simple. And like their trains are just like made out of stone and they just have people inside who are just like mm -hmm. pushing them along these stone monorail type yeah. things. Brandon goes into a similar thing in the arithmetist where, real. because all of the, <laughs> wow, because all of the, uh, not magic system, but all the tech is gear based. And yeah. so in, in the arithmetist, he's created the, the gear trains and the gears are wound by chalk links. Yep. And so it, you know, it, it, it's all interconnected. How is this going to affect day-to-day -day life? How is this going to affect the advance of technology? That's one of the things that he went into in uh, Mistborn Era 1 because technology hadn't advanced and because it was it. being deliberately. And so because of that, he was able to go into it in Era 2. Yep. Well, and, and he even. talks about that with his world building where he gets a concept, uh, like an idea, like what if? And then he really starts to delve deep on the implications of that idea. And mm -hmm. so like he does that with uh, the, the very, the very start of Warbreaker, I think is a great example of, all right, how would you create a cage for an awakener? And mm -hmm. they're trying to it's like, all right, so we need to have, you know, this color and this, you know, make it so that they can't touch anything and yeah. all this other stuff. And, but it's, it's a, it's a world building thing. It, you go to, Mistborn. It's like, well, there's got to be people who specialize in taking on special people. And so he the comes Hayes up killers. with the Haze Killers. Yeah. And then you get to Era 2, and he's like, all right, well, they have all this lore from the old world. How would that shape them now? And you have things like the Haze Killer rounds, you know, pulling from the lore of their own world to, to name these specialized bullets. Mm -hmm. And it it's just these little tiny things add so much depth. Sunni cubs add so much depth. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were talking about jails for awakeners in the emperor's soul. That's one of the first things we're mm -hmm. introduced to is the jail for a, shy, uh, yeah. a, a shy. Oh my gosh, forger. Forger. Is that forger? Yep. And you know, because, and it, they just go deep into that. And part of the thing that's really cool is not only do they go deep into what would be necessary to create that jail, they explore her character by going deep into her figuring out exactly how to escape. Yep. And, and it just, it just makes the world richer. It makes her character more interesting because suddenly we're seeing how she sees the world mm -hmm. and it brings us in. Well, uh, another, like going on that same detail, we just literally the last episode, the night of, of Gavilar's death, mm -hmm. seeing it from so many different perspectives completely changes every single time goes just a little bit deeper, adds another yeah. layer to it. And it's like, we're, we're rehashing the exact same night over and over again, but just something as simple as changing the perspective of it adds a lot of depth yeah. because yeah. everyone has different different goals everyone has a different backgrounds everyone has different plots and plans and they mm -hmm. weren't all in the same spot so you're seeing this little corner that you didn't see before and this other little spot and this other thing and with Gavilar you're seeing more of the same things because he's at the center of it all but mm -hmm. yeah you're I getting mean, yeah. very different perspectives. he's, he's intimately involved in his own assassination it's true oh yes yes <laughs> yeah it's just it's so it makes personal. sense. It feels it's, a little it, personal. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's a really cool, like, I, I, I like this one a lot. This, this law as, as it were. And it, I, I'm fuzzy on all the details, but I, it kind of makes me think of how Vin and Kelsey are both had their own different specialties when they, with their mm -hmm. misborn powers and that they were better at different metals. And then I, feel like when we saw all the different characters in the crew we got to see how they use their specialities like that they only had they were misting so they only had the one right for well, each I, of them yeah but they got and, to use their abilities in ways that a misborn may not have because a misborn is trying to do 
all the metals versus the misting is just doing their one. And so they're finding ways to use it that are far more deep and expanded. And because of that, Kelsier had them each train her. Yes. Yeah. Because he knew they, they knew it better than he did. Him. Yep. Well, and, and then, you want to go into why is Vin by the end of this series far better than Kelsier was? And everyone was like, holy crap, Kelsier. You know, yeah. like being better than Kelsier at steel pushing is quite a feat. Mm-hmm. Um, but because that, that was his specialty. But mm-hmm. who was he trained by? Well, he was sort of trained by the, you know, crazy the crazy guy? prospector. <laughs> and, yeah. it, you know, he's not exactly the best, the best trainer because he's approaching it like a mistborn. Like he's telling Kelsey or quit being cute with these things, you know, just do this, go simple. And so mm-hmm. when we see like Kelsey or do uh, emotional allomancy, he's fairly non. <laughs> yeah. He's not very <laughs> subtle about it. We see breeze and it's like, he's conducting a symphony. Yeah. You see Marsh and Marsh is talking about no pulse links and this, you, you know, you go to Spook and Spook's talking about it's not just what you can sense. Sometimes it's what you can ignore. Yeah. That's the most mm-hmm. important. And she's getting she's getting all these individual cram sessions from people who are really good at their individual metals that mm-hmm. Kelsier never had. And yeah. so by but the time e- even the they, concept of the, the savant does that that same yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. But and by the time, of, yeah, yeah, and so you you sit here and you study it, and you're just like, oh man, no wonder. Like, obviously, she's also the chosen one, and that helps. But, <laughs> um, but you know, no wonder she's so good at it. Like, it'd be so easy for her to be the 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 prototypical Mary Mary Sue that you know we always complain about in fiction. You know, she's the chosen one. She's great at everything. Uh, you know, and all this other stuff, but because we see her really study hard and really she hone her craft, no, no one really complains about it because, because she earned it. Yeah. She earns yeah. it. And so the Mary Sue, Gary Stu or whatever it's called, you know, yeah. it doesn't apply here. Mm-hmm. Despite, you know, fitting in some of those tropes. Well, even looking at uh, the stormlight archive, which is a different situation because Brandon introduced 10 different kinds of magic yeah. as times three, you know, yep. because we, because there are three different shards at work on this planet and the, it's just, it's interesting the way it all works together. But even with the, uh, the, the 10 orders of the Knights radiant, each book focuses on one. You know, the, the wind runners book one is their book. Yes. They're yeah. important co- over the course of the rest of the series. Book one is where he digs deep into wind runners. Yeah. Book two is where he starts digging deep into light weavers. And as in the later books, he continues to dig deep into the ones that have already been represented, but, but he's got his main focus. I'm suddenly, I'm about. suddenly realizing book one really much really is the phase one of Marvel um, for the stormlight archive. The characters don't meet. Right. right. Kaladin, Shalon, and Dalin, like he only meets Dalin at the very end. Mm -hmm. Um, But they don't really meet in that, in that book. And so we really get to delve into these characters alone. Cause like, even when, by the time Shalon finally meets Dalinar and Kaladin, she's not interacting with them a ton, even in that second book until the chasm. Uh, Yeah. And so, but by that point, we've sort of dug enough into these characters that now we want to see the interplay. Mm-hmm. Well, and then he introduces Lyft and uh, Zeth to them in Oathbringer. And it's just, it's a slow gathering, yeah. but it's, again, it's a diving deep into each of them over the course of a bigger series. And then of course he looks at the, uh, the resonances that each of the, them have, because the the concept of interconnection where he's like, you take this magic system and this magic system, you put them together. What does that mean? And so you've got the, the wind runners who have gravitation and adhesion and you take the, the sky breakers who have gravitation and division and you take, and, and you see how those all interact together and what it yeah. exactly it means. It also just from a narrative standpoint, because he slowly is bringing these characters together, it 
he still gets to have so many different interactions that we haven't seen yet. And so, you know, it would be, it would feel really bad if we started having Kaladin and Zeth scenes before mm-hmm. Kaladin and Dalinar's relationship is really worked out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It would be really disappointing to see Shalon and, uh, and, and Yesna not get worked out, you know, beforehand, you know, but it's like, Oh no, now we're at Shalon and Lopin are having these conversations over here. It's like, no, 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 we have to develop this thing first. Mm-hmm. Brandon yeah. lets these things slow burn. Mm-hmm. And then you get the payoff. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it works on so many levels. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I also, I feel like that's kind of one of the failings, in my opinion, of Rhythm of War. Um, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Rhythm of War is a bad book. It's probably my least favorite of the Stormlight books, although it has some um, incredible peaks in it. But he's worked over the course of one, two and three books, one, two and three to bring these characters together. Book four, they all split apart again and it feels a lot more disjointed again. Um, And, and so I feel like that's a part of it is because suddenly he's split up and, and he is going wide and trying to achieve all these different things at once. Now, part of that's probably because he's, he's got to finish up this first five book arc. And he's so he's got to, he's got to start getting people and moving them into the right places so that they can be in the right spot for the conclusion of that arc. But mm-hmm. it does make it feel a bit more disjointed. And suddenly there's all sorts of new stuff that's coming in from every direction. Yeah. Especially the Venley chapters, mm-hmm. um, because Venley, by the very nature of her situation, she can't really interact with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Kaladin, by the very nature of his situation, he can't really interact with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, Navani, by her situation, the yeah. only person she's react she's really talking to is Raboniel. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. you just start going through like all these different problems, and everyone's problems are kind of self-contained problems. Mm-hmm. And so the parts of the books that we have been really liking which has been a lot of the interconnection does have by the very nature of what's happening in rhythm of war Mm -hmm. ends up uh, splitting up. But that said, there's a lot of character growth that was necessary for that, but it did feel much closer to the way of Kings than Oathbringer. It's very possible that um, rhythm of war will be a much better book. Once book five is out. Yeah. Because there, there are certain things where it's like, okay, right now, I don't like this yet, but there are, you know, you can have a later thing come out that can sort of save the earlier stuff because it Way led to where like you were that. expecting it to go. Yeah. Way of Kings is absolutely like that. Sh- sh- because I, I actively disliked Shalon's chapters in Way of Kings. <laughs> um, just, it felt so pointless. Mm-hmm. Once we understand who Taravanchian is and who Yesna is as people. And who Shalon is. Yeah, and who Shalon is. You go back to those chapters, but especially Yesna in Taravangian, mm-hmm. because we're seeing this through Shalon's more naive eyes before she's yeah. re- really, you know, right. keyed into what's going on. Those chapters have so much depth in them that we didn't know about because what felt like a doddering old king is suddenly the big bad. Oh, boy. Right. Yeah. And so seeing it through Shalon's, uh, at this point, n- not discerning eyes, because that she's she's focused on you know her plot to steal a uh, a uh, surge binder, a, not surge binder. Uh, oh, what is it called? Soulcaster. Soulcaster. Soul no, yes. I didn't think it. Words are hard. A soulcaster. Which, for the record, <sighs> man, talk about how how low the stakes were at the start. Oh boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have a broken soulcaster, and we're gonna go. Abs- our, our, our fat house is going to go under and it's like yeah well How all of our shards going to go under <laughs> in just two in just a couple of books like that broken soul caster you that, just not even a concern <laughs> yeah it was a MacGuffin yep well and another example and okay I am. I know I'm about to step into a hornet's nest right now because there's just so many divided opinions. The new Star Wars trilogy. One of the biggest complaints that I've seen from a lot of people 
is the fact that we never saw the original three from the original trilogy on screen together. Han Leia and, and Han Luke. Leia and Luke. Um, and because and and that's one of the biggest complaints a lot of people ha- seem to have against the new trilogy is it doesn't build on what was there before. It really it really just tries to go wide immediately. Which wouldn't um, be as big of an annoyance if the depth of the old series wasn't also there at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like, also, I almost I almost feel like if they had just jumped a hundred years in the future and Han, Luke, and Leia were just gone, we wouldn't care that much. If we had like a missed one, it would too. make sense that they weren't there, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whereas, um, like, I get like my big frustration with like the Last Jedi, the scene where because Luke's being pissy about everything in that book, which or or book that movie, which you know we can get into the this doesn't feel like the same character we left off with. But like when Chewbacca comes in and yells at Luke briefly and just walks out, that scene pissed me off because I'm like, Luke and Chewie are friends. How are we not dwelling on this scene here with these two needing to yell at each other and work? I I could see like Chewie like bopping him on the head and being like, get over it. I need like a five to ten minute scene between these two characters. Mm -hmm. Chewie just lost Han. Like yeah. This is a mm-hmm. fresh wound. Friends should be there for each other. But literally, that's the only time we see Luke with Chewie. It's right there. And they've and been nothing. on the same stupid island. <laughs> they didn't um, bother going deep at all. And I think another thing that I've I've heard about that trilogy is that they're trying to, at least at the beginning, they were trying to redo the original trilogy, but with new characters, kind of. That, that it's like, yeah. yeah. But that's a whole other thing. Anyway. Yeah, that... But. Like and and again, I don't want in t- to get into a dissection of the the Star Wars trilogy. I know that's a hotbed and a, but but I think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from is that it just well yeah, and it, but yeah, because but but no but I think it's a great point because it hurts it on both ends because because we're also stuck with one foot in the past we don't really develop a relationship between Ray and Finn, between mm-hmm. Finn and Poe, between, you know, like they, we don't bo- we don't get as much time with that. Cause we're also, you know, constantly being distracted by, Oh my goodness. That's that character. I like. Well, and, and you so also we don't ha- get, I- so we don't get to go yeah. either direction. And you also have two directors who won't go deep on what the previous one did. Oh yeah, and they just like bopped around between things too. And so, it, that didn't help. Anyway, but that, you know what? That also brings us back to the D, the DC cinematic universe, where you know they they switch Justice League, you know, mm-hmm. halfway through for some legitimate reasons, but with two yeah. directors with completely different visions. Yeah, and it's like, huh this this movie feels a little disjointed. I wonder why. <laughs> and it's like you go the next the Star Wars trilogy, huh? These these three films don't really feel. Uh, like they have a cohesive plan going right. together. Yeah. I wonder why. Mm. Yeah. It's not, you know, now you could point out the original trilogy had three different directors, but two different. Lucas was the there the entire director. time. Yes, yeah. exactly. Because they it was very hands on. Three directors, but one writer. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, having some consistency lets you really explore that. I mean, look, even in Brandon's books, like, you know, we just got done talking about how Rhythm of War didn't really, you know, didn't quite work for you the way that the previous books did. For me, Way of Kings didn't quite work for me. Mm-hmm. So why did we, why didn't we stop reading Brandon? Well, Brandon has done enough, you know, goodwill and built it mm-hmm. up that even when something feels a little shallow, we're confident the depth is actually there and we will get to it. We'll give him yeah, the benefit he's, he's, of the he's doubt. He's proven himself enough times that we trust him and, on that. Mm-hmm. And so, but that's one of the reasons for this law that Brandon wrote is it's all in the end, it, it comes back to the same thing. It always comes back to is payoffs. And the reason you go deep before you go wide is you have to pay off first the stuff you've already made promises on. Mm-hmm. And so you got to build up that goodwill. And, and and that's one thing that he was doing in uh, Rhythm of War. There were so many things that were just sort of dropped in. Oh, by the way, here's three more shards. Oh, by the way, this is you know just, 
just basically he was, he started dropping stuff because I think he recognized I need to make some payoffs because I'm about to ask some big questions. Yeah. But you know what? I now I'm now thinking about how does he tend to drop those big breadth, you know, things he tends to do it in the epigrams. Mm -hmm. He doesn't tend to do it in the middle of the story itself. And so it doesn't like, even when he's sort of expanding it outward, like the, the interludes are completely, uh, all, they're always expanding the breadth rather mm -hmm. than the depth. Because yeah. um, you're dealing with a different character each and every time. And he's sewing the groundwork so that now we're wanting that depth. This is going to give him an opportunity, you know, because people want Hoyd's story. People want to know where, um, ha what happened between Vivina and and Vasher. People want to know this, and so he he's he's putting those things into place so that he can go deep on them. He's not trying to go wide, and that's the story. He's basically tossing out seeds that so so that they can sort of start to grow into our in our subconscious, and then he's like, okay, here we go. You know that this is here. I'm going deep. So a good example of that would be the. Uh the 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 soul caster lady uh that we got an interlude for where oh, they went to the island of akina mm -hmm. yeah and that that you know that becomes its own little mini novelette right. that uh -huh. we follow up on and we Don still Shard. have no clue what's going on with that lighthouse keep for or not not the you lighthouse talking, you talking about Ryano? no no not Ryano. The... no where he's like helping everyone and he's like all excited because it means oh some... the 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 blue guy on the far east in uh, yeah. in okay. in Nat Natten. yeah the one seeing so, all the storms yeah we we have no clue what that's about but because we see a pattern of Brandon using an interlude to lay a, a foundation because but like the interludes between Akina and all the Rissen ones mm -hmm. you know like oh, holy cow that's an entire book that he was able to mine out of this yeah right well and then the uh, the Herdazian general. In yeah. you know he was introduced in an interlude. Lift was introduced in an interlude. interlude yeah, she got her own book, which mm -hmm. tied into Seth, and yep. tied into Nail, and yep. it's just one of these things because he keeps like and this is but this is why you have to build like you eventually do have to go wider, like because mm -hmm. if you only keep drilling down, it's like you're just having the same conversation over and over yeah. again. If you don't ever branch out. If it'll get tired. And so, but he does a good job of, like you said, laying a seed mm -hmm. and it's like, we'll harvest this later. Yeah. Well, we'll let it grow just a little bit and then we'll come back. Yeah. And and that's why it works when he goes wider. And because, you know, with the Stormlight Archive, he's building this huge epic and that's only a part of the bigger epic of the Cosmere itself. Yeah. He's laying, and that's the other thing. He's putting some seeds in each of these different series. And Hoyt is, you know, he's basically Johnny Appleseed, you know, hopping <laughs> along from world to world. And yeah, but yeah, no, it's just absolutely fascinating stuff. But yeah, but it's it's something you always say, Bill, about English. You got to know the the rules before you can break them. Yep. Uh, yep. And this is a good example of Brandon understands his own laws, and so he knows when it's time to to play with it. And he he does he did this over the course of the first Mistborn trilogy as well because he would always have the exception for each culture you know he to to explain the terrorist culture he gave a Sezet who was the exception to explain the uh, the uh, what the the Kandra culture mm -hmm. he gave us Tinsoon who was the mm -hmm. exception yeah. um, to explain the Kolos culture he gave us Human who was the exception. And so he, he, that, that's the other thing. He goes deep into these exceptions, which gives us clues into the whole. It, it's, it's really a fascinating uh, method of writing. Well, and you know what? It even sort of goes into the magic system over that trilogy. Um, because the first book, because we spend so much time in Vin's head, um, we learn about allomancy and how it works. Um, and we learn a little, like we find out that Farukami is a thing. We understand how some of it works, but only enough so that when she, uh, fights the Lord ruler and she figures out that he's a Farukamist, that she understands what she's got to do. 
Mm-hmm. It's yeah. really the second book where where we get the Seized perspectives, where we really get to delve into what is Farukami and how does it work, mm-hmm. especially in combat, because we then get Seized's uh, perspectives in <laughs> His, combat. Yes. Yeah. And then the third book, we get start to get into hemolurgy and what that does. But notice those all three of those systems were there from the very beginning. He could have been like, oh, no, there's three systems, guys. Look how exciting this is. But all he didn't. He went he deep. instead went deep on one at a time. Mm-hmm. And it's narratively far more satisfying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, like I remember when I first realized that, oh, that with the Stormlight Archive, each of these is going to focus on one of the 10 orders of radiance because you don't even really know about the radiance when you f- read the first book. But once you like once the second book comes out, you start to you're like, wait, this was a Windrunner book and this is suddenly a Lightweaver book. And you start realize and then Brandon, through words of Brandon, announced these are the different um, orders, perspectives that we're going to get. Oh, yeah. Suddenly you realize there's an example of each of them. And it also allows you to predict, make make predictions because one of them doesn't fit. And you're like, okay, there's going to be a change. But that but once I realized that he was laying that out. I actually got really excited because that meant I was going to be able to dive deep into each of these orders and get some more information about them. Yeah. I do see why though, as far as I, that feels like a bit of a, an over promise because the wind runner book, we actually don't get that much about wind runners because we don't. And then even the light weaver book, we don't get that much about mm-hmm. light weavers because Shalon's figuring out her like everyone's always figuring out the very basics of their powers. And then the actual yeah. depth we get is in later books. Yeah. Again, he's planting those seeds yeah. in each of the books. And when, when you have a, a series, the scale of 10 books, you can, you can afford you to, to putz around a little bit. <laughs> well, like you're mentioning in, uh, in Oathbringer, we get little bits of the, uh, of the, what are they called? Bondsmiths. Bondsmiths. But in book four, that's when we suddenly see Dalinar are pulling off some stuff that we're just like, whoa, he can what? What? Say <laughs> nothing of what that? Ishar did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, and, and so Vani, it's, it's, out of it's really interesting. But so so almost as a as a counter rule to uh, or counter law to this, um, not or not a counter law, but just sort of an aside as, co law, I, I guess. Corollary. Um, corollary. Corollary. That's the word I'm looking for. Um. To go deep, you have to lay this, the groundwork before that so that there's something to go deep into. Yeah. Was it, You can't start off with Gandalf the White. No. Right. You have to start with Hobbiton. You have to start with Gandalf the Grey and with Saruman the White. Because without either of those, then suddenly, you know, Gandalf the White doesn't make as much sense. It doesn't have as big of an impact. You know, the fact that Gandalf steps into the role of the white wizard and there's still a white wizard. <laughs> there, there, there's meaning behind it that you can dig deep into and suddenly you're just like, oh, what are the implications of this? And again, your brain starts going off and filling in. And it's just, yeah. yeah. All right. Tolkien, token, <laughs> you, the books, the, the notes are there and you know it's all it is all there like everyone else there's hints that there's there with tolkien <laughs> it's all there <laughs> yeah like is it insane an outliner as brandon is i don't know if there's ever been an outliner like jrr tolkien i still oh, love that no. the hobbit got written because his his kid was nitpicking details of the bedtime story he was getting though he's like no but the door was green and he's like ah oh, fine gotta start writing this down so and then uh, Lord of the Rings was there as a backdrop for his new language because he went deep. <laughs> oh, we love hearing from our listeners, so please keep on sending in your questions. And also, tell us what you think of Sanderson's Third Law. What are areas that you've noticed in both Brandon's books and outside of them that the law applies? Or give us counterexamples. I'd love to see them. Uh, you can also ask us about the Cosmere. You can drop us your ideas for topics that you'd like us to discuss during the show. And while you're at it, we'd love to hear your feedback about how you think we're doing. We love, love, love feedback. And if you have any interesting theories about what's going on in the Cosmere, what might be coming up, 
Um, send those questions and suggestions in a brief, concise email to Cosmere Studies at gmail.com, and we could read that as part of the show. Um, we also have a P.O. Box at the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, P.O. Box 970063, or Utah 84097. We also have our own personal projects that we're working on outside of this podcast. So, Jordan, why don't you tell us where we can find you and what you've got going on lately? Um, as I said, sort of near the start, um, I've moved everything all the way over to YouTube. Um, I have launched what we've called Operation 4000. The reason it's called that is because to get monetized on YouTube, you have to hit a bunch of uh, goals. I've hit three of the four. The last one I need is 4,000 viewed hours on YouTube. Um, I have created a playlist. If you have, say, a spare computer that you're like, you know, I'm not that interested in what Jordan has to say, but he seems like a pretty swell guy. I'd like to help him out. Um, maybe uh, go to youtube.com slash splice stream. Find the Operation 4000 playlist. Just hit play and uh, you know, know that you're helping me out. If you actually like my content, I know a lot of you don't <laughs> like Twitch. Um, I'm now going to be doing this on YouTube. So just follow my channel and I'm right there for you. Yeah, I was going to say, you're jumping right to the cynical, even if you don't like my stuff, I want to help them out. It's just like, or maybe they'll like your stuff. Maybe. <laughs> I have found with, because I pick a we I pick weird niche things with my content. <laughs> I jump to the cynical and then I, I try and like people then like, well, let's see what this is about. And then they say, holy crap, uh, XCOM's fun. Amiibo are awesome. And then they, that's how you, that's how I get them. Jordan, don't tell them how you're building your cult. Shh, don't look, your secrets. look, I can't help you with mental health, but I do have this cult for you. Oh, God. Um, Amy, how about you uh, to draw attention away from Jordan? Uh, t say something about you. So my Facebook is Coincidence Cosplay and Props. My Twitter is at Coincidence Cosp because my name is too long. My Instagram is at Coincidence underscore Cosplay. And my TikTok is at Coincidence Cosplay, all one giant word um my website is www.coincidencecosplay.com and it is very sad and still has not been updated um real life has kind of taken over my life so and i've had a cold for like a month so i'm kind Did of you say you had that. a cult for a month jordan we're talking we're, we're moving away from the cult <laughs> oh talk. sorry i just wanted to understand well i do have two children does that count as a cult um yeah i don't know anyway um so I from, from your still... stories, no, it doesn't. They don't sound like they follow instructions very well. <laughs> I'm One just trying to keep this away from cults. Anyway, um, they're very cute, but you don't get to see their faces. Sorry. Um, so I am still not done with my Nas school, but I just have the boots left, and I'm going to get them done. Um, and I'm going to try and post more things now that I'm not going on random trips and getting my trailer ready and all sorts of craziness and painting my bedroom and blah, 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 things that you don't care about. So, um, I'm going to be doing cosplay stuff and I hope to, once I'm not congested and all the fun things, start actually trying to do more stuff on TikTok with my D and D TikTok group. So yes, that's me. Cool. As for me, I do have another podcast. Uh, my friend Dylan and I talk about board games. It's a lot of fun because I love board games. And so that's fun to me. And um, they now have a really awesome intro. I, I was about to say, it's called The Innkeeper's Table. We get new ep episodes uh, every Friday morning. And we just are about to hit our two-year mark. Um, this Sunday, I think, will be two years. Bye -bye. And as part of that, we got a brand new intro. It's got music. It's got... a awesome voice actor introducing it. It's really cool. You should check it out. Pro it's professional just for the voice intro. actor. Yeah. Professional cool. voice actor. It's true. Um, Amy and I have sampled it. 10 out of 10 good. would recommend. <laughs> if, yep. if you're familiar with Eric Summerer, he's done voice acting and audiobook narrations. And he's also one of the hosts of the Dice Tower podcast, which just ended, but he's now one of the hosts of the At the Table podcast. No, no connection to the Innkeeper's Table other than the Innkeeper's Table is part of the Dice Tower network. Um, our most recent episode that we did, we did a game spotlight on a board game called Decorum, which is referred to as a passive aggressive game of cohabitation where it's cooperative and you're trying to de decorate a house in a way that everyone living there will like. And each of you has cards with requirements of what you need in the house. It's great, particularly because it really encourages not directly, but just through the way it works out, a little bit of role play. 
because somebody's like, okay, I think we should put this green hanging wall hanging in this room. And you're just like, no, you're ruining everything. You're throwing off my feng shui. Stop it. And <laughs> you're messing with my groove. You threw off my groove. <laughs> and it's just, um, it, it's so much fun. So you should check out, that was our most recent episode. Our next episode, we um, will be looking at the top three games that took us by surprise in a good way. The games that we weren't expecting to love that just sort of came out of nowhere. And we said, oh, wow, that's great. So um, that should be coming out on Friday. So check that one out. And as is well. that is that one one ninety nine? No, that one. No, no, no. We've already hit. We've already hit one hundred. Um, it, it, that'll be episode one oh four. That'll be. It, oh, so they said two hundred. No, no, Sorry. we're hitting our two year okay, I anniversary. Like, I really lost track of those episode numbers. How many weeks do you think there are in a year, Jordan? <laughs> it's difficult to say. The number's partially fused with infinity. Yeah, after the after the last two years, I think everybody. <laughs> I still sometimes think to myself, like, "What year is it?" I oh, still think to myself, you know, when somebody says about ten years ago, I think, "Okay, so in the nineties." No, no, sweet child, I'm, that I'm was not, not that the nineties. I, I think early two thousands, and then I'm like, "Wait a minute, wait, that's not right." That was twenty years ago. To be, Shh, to don't, be, don't know. To You're be old. fair. I, <laughs> to be fair, I'm getting ready to turn 40, all right? So, <laughs> oh. uh, for no, those of I, you who... I, I had one of those on my stream recently where <laughs> I, I don't know, I was saying something about Smash because, you know, I've played it since its inception, the 64. And there was like, yeah, I was too young for Smash Brothers Brawl. And I'm just like, oh. I was in college when Smash Brothers oh, Brawl boy. came out. Yeah, I'm seeing friends posting pictures on Facebook of well, my friends from high school posting pictures of their kids going to prom, and it just hurts. So, <laughs> uh, for those of our listeners who do want to support the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies and our geriatric ways, but you can't become patrons, we would love it if you just let your friends know about the show. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, to like and subscribe over on youtube.com slash Cosmere Studies. And if you toss us a good review wherever you listen, that would be amazing. We'd love it. Also, head over to store.streamelements.com slash Cosmere Studies to buy six merch. That's right. You, too, can have wonderful six emblazoned gear like T-shirts and blankets coffee and coffee mugs and phone cases and all sorts of good stuff. So go do that. Um, I'm really hoping someone buys the blanket because I, I put that one in the store on a lark. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw, I think wait, we can do put a blanket here? <laughs> On a minky, no less. That's I'm all soft. for it. Yeah, all I right. didn't know what a minky was. My mom got my grandparents that it's for so Christmas. Soft. They have it just draped over the top of their couch. And literally, there's not a person in my family. I've I've noticed this. It's just everyone. If you walk by the couch, everyone's hands go over it. <laughs> because just everyone's like, it's so soft. It's, it's kind of wonderful. Touchy. Yeah. All right. So final thoughts on the third law of magic. Yeah, it's, Sanderson's it's, third law of magic. It's a good law. Like it makes me appreciate world building a mm -hmm. lot. I, I'm just really glad that we got to get to this episode because as the year goes on, I don't know how many of these little one-off episodes of these nice little fun niche topics we're going to be able to get because stuff's going to start hitting pretty quick. Oh man, it's gonna be boom, 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 rapid yeah. fire. Yep, yep. Amazing. We're we're as we get later on into the year, as we get closer to to Dragon Steel and to the release of the Lost Metal, and then of course the Year of Sanderson. Yeah, the beginning I was gonna of say the like once, thousand year rule of Sanderson. Once, once we get the like, start getting the the preview chapters for Lost Metal. Oh, we th there's a very real possibility we're spending like the next two years on nothing but actual like books. We're we're back to we're back to our first year. Yeah, our first couple yeah. years where we're actually talking about the the deep <laughs> readings of books. Which it's you know what? Book two. So. I'm okay with that. Yeah, me so. too. I'm I'm definitely okay with that. Yes. Uh, special thanks to our patron producer, Mims Laundry Service. Police call it evidence. We call it a fun challenge. In addition to the live episodes of the show that stream on twitch.tv slash innkeepers table every two weeks on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 
Listeners can find our videos on YouTube or the audio versions of the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and just about any other service that carries podcasts by searching for Cosmere Studies. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the profile at Cosmere Studies. And if you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions for the show, email them to Cosmere Studies at gmail.com. In our next episode, we are going to go back a bit because we realized that we accidentally skipped over Words of Radiance in our discussions of the art from the Stormlight Archive. So we'll be doing that. So make sure to be here for the live discussion at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern in two weeks on May 23rd, 2022 at www.twitch.tv slash Until then, on behalf of Amy, Jordan, and myself, thanks for listening. And remember, there's, there's always, always another secret. Another secret.